Today we're going to begin with chapter one, which is just an introduction to biology. Um, during this video, feel free to pause and stop to take notes or rewind to listen to whatever I'm saying again. Okay. Now, in biology, there are 12 levels of organization, like a hierarchy of how things are organized. So in science, that's what we like to do. We like to categorize things. We like to arrange things, organize things. Um, you have what's called emergent properties, which means that every level that you go up, it increases in complexity. Um, it becomes more interesting. It becomes more complicated. Um, the very bottom level, you'll see that there's an atom. And then atoms are very simple. They can come together to form what's called a molecule. And then an example of a molecule is DNA. And then we know that we are made up of DNA. DNA is what is the blueprint of what makes who we are. And then these molecule, different molecules, they come together to form an organelle. An example of an organelle is a nucleus. So in the nucleus, we have where our DNA is housed, where it is contained. There's other organelles, such as the Golgi apparatus, um, the rough ER lysosomes, which you guys will learn eventually. And then all these organelles, they come together to form what's called a cell. And then there's different types of cells. So in this example, we have a nerve cell, which is a neuron. And then these cells, they come together to form nervous tissue. Okay, so nervous tissue is a group of similar cells that come together to form this tissue. So this nervous tissue, it can be formed of or made up of neurons, astrocytes, my, uh, microglial cells. These are all similar cells that come together. Now, do you notice how, you know, when it increases in, in the level, the complexity of it increases? And then these tissue, they come together to form what's called an organ. And then in our example, we have the brain. Um, the different tissues is maybe gray matter and white matter of the brain. And then organs, they can form to form the organ system or the nervous system in our example. And then um, example is the organ of the spinal cord and the organ of the brain. Okay, we're not going to go through the rest of these, um, but it's pretty self-explanatory, like the molecule is more complex than the atom, the organelle is more complex than the molecule, the cell is more complex than the organelle. Um, new characteristics come about when you increase in the level of this hierarchy. Now, in when I was a student, I liked to find ways to memorize stuff that made sense to me. So this is one of my tricks or ways that I used as a student um, to memorize all of these 12 levels of organization. Um, in order, I used Beck Poot Coma. So the first one is your biosphere, and then that's the most complex, that's the most in inclusive. Okay, that include everything. And then lastly, at the very bottom, you have the atom, which is the most um, exclusive. Okay. So for your exam, you're going to have to know, oh, if I give you an example of a spinal cord, what level would that be at? Well, that would be an organ or um, a liver cell. What type, you know, what uh, organization is that in? Well, it'd be a cell or a lysosome. That would be an organelle. And then feel free to email me if you have any problems with this, or you can even come to my office. Okay. In our ecosystem, we um, every organism, every li living thing has a role to play. We you know, since we eat other organisms, whether you're a vegetarian that only eats plants, or where you're an, um, where you eat um, other organisms like animals as well. Okay, so we, us animals, we are consumers because we eat other organisms to sustain our life. Whereas plants, they can make their own food. Okay, they don't need to consume or eat other organisms. And then these producers, these plants, they use a process called photosynthesis. Photo means light, synthesis means to make. And what they do is that they take the carbon dioxide 
from the environment, from the atmosphere. And then water, whether we give them water or water, to, water that comes from the rainfall, and then the energy from the sunlight to convert these molecules, see how these are examples of molecules, to make their own food in the form of glucose, which is a sugar. And then in the process of photosynthesis, they make a, a byproduct, um, which is oxygen gas. And then they release it into the atmosphere. And then what do we do with that oxygen, oxygen gas? Well, we are going to inhale it and go through a process called cellular respiration. Cellular respiration, okay? So with oxygen and then the food that we eat, particularly glucose, we're going to turn these molecules into a chemical form of energy that our cells can use to do things that you know they need to do every day so that we can go about our business, so that we can um, sustain our life. And then in the process of cellular respiration, we make a byproduct called carbon dioxide. And then it's this carbon dioxide that we exhale out, that we breathe out. And then what do you think is going to happen to this carbon dioxide once it's in the atmosphere? Well, it's going to be recycled and go through photosynthesis. The plant is going to use that carbon dioxide to make their food. So you can see that you know we have this relationship with plants. And then there's a cycle of nutrients um, that will continue that we need and plants need. Also in the process, we have uh, organisms called decomposers. And then these decomposers, what they do is that they recycle nutrients, they break down dead organic molecules or um, material into simple molecules, into nutrients that can be deposited into the soil for plants to use. And some examples of these are bacteria, worms, uh, fungi, which include mushrooms and mold. So if you see a mushroom, um, think that you know they are decomposers. What they're doing is that they're breaking down material and then depositing in the soil so that the plants can use it. And then molds, what happens is if you can imagine a forest full of leaves, well, you know, during the autumn season, the leaves fall down and then if we don't have any organisms to break them down, to um, recycle them, you know, the forest is just going to be full of leaves, like, you know, five feet of leaves, and we can never maneuver around the forest. So these molds are responsible for breaking those leaves down and then recycling, putting those nutrients back into the soil so those forest trees can grow big and tall. Um, for the exam, you're going to need to know, you know, what a bear is an example of. What role does a bear play? Well, a bear eats fish, okay? A bear eats berries, and then so that means that they would be consumers. What would an earthworm uh, play a role as? Well, they are decomposers. They will break down um, uh, complex organic material into simple materials that we can use, that plants can use. Or what is... Um, a uh, palm tree. What role does a palm tree play? They are a producer. They can make their own food, um, specifically glucose. So what are all living things made up of? If something is classified as living, what are they made up of? Cells. Okay, so there are two types of cells, basically. One is a prokaryotic cell. Prokaryotic means before the nucleus. So that means that the prokaryotic cells, um, they do not have a nucleus. And these will include your bacteria cells and your archaean cells. Now, archaean cells are microorganisms that like to live in extreme conditions, such as um, high pressure, high uh, sulfur con um, concentrations, high temperature concentrations. And then the opposite, we have what's called eukaryotic cell. Eukaryotic means true nucleus. So that means these cells will have a nucleus. Okay. And then we animals, we are made up of eukaryotic cells because we have a nucleus. 
Okay. So for the exam, you're going to have to compare and contrast prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Now, this picture isn't in your book, but you can Google it online and you'll find it as well. The only thing that's different is that I added this cell wall here. So let's take a look at this prokaryotic cell. So the prokaryotic cells are small and simple. Okay. And then they, of course, have DNA if they are living that means that they have DNA. We need to have DNA so we can make things that our cells need. They are the like the recipe or the blue book. And then like I said before, prokaryotic cells do not have a nucleus, but instead they have something that's called the nucleoid region. The nucleoid region. And then these little dots that you see around, sorry, that you see around the nucleoid region are called ribosomes. Now these ribosomes, they will make the protein that um, is instructed in the DNA. So anything that's living will need ribosomes um, to make protein so that we can you know, do things, go about our business. And then the yellow part in here is called the cytoplasm. It's just um, a fluid-filled medium where things are suspended in, and then we can encase all this material into what's called a plasma membrane, a plasma membrane, okay? So all cells will have a plasma membrane as well. And then on the outside of the prokaryotic cell, you have this rigid structure that's called the cell wall. So the cell wall is for protection for the prokaryotic cell. Now, animal cells don't have a cell wall, but plant cells do have a cell wall. Now let's compare that to a eukaryotic cell. So the eukaryotic cell, you can see that it's much larger, so and it's also more complex. And the first thing that it has is the nucleus, which has the DNA in it. Okay, and then these structures outside are organelles. You can have the mitochondria that makes energy. You can have the rough ER that makes proteins. You can have the smooth ER that makes lipids, etc. <clears throat> and then these eukaryotic cells, what they have also is called the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane to hold everything inside of it so things don't fall out. Okay. So it holds these membrane-bound organelles, okay? So it's important that the eukaryotic cells, you know that they have membrane-bound organelles, whereas the prokaryotic cells do not have membrane-bound organelles. So know the differences between them, and then the similarities between them is that they both have DNA, they both have ribosomes, they both have cytoplasm, and they both have a plasma membrane, okay? So all these cells will have these four structures um, the same, similar, okay? So for when you're comparing contrast, I always like to make a chart of things. Um, so, you know, use this and make a chart so that you can remember it better. Let's talk about the DNA. So the DNA is made up of two strands that are connected to each other, and it is a molecule, is a very long molecule, and then it's what's being passed down from cell to cell um, when it undergoes cell division or from parent to offspring, you know, like us, from our parents to us, and then if we have kids or have kids, our DNA is going to be passed down from us to our kids. And then each section or segment on the DNA is what's called a gene. And then a gene encodes for a particular trait. So for example, this gene can code for the color of your eyes. And then this gene, this section of the DNA, can code for the color of your hair. Okay, and so on and so on. And then these genes um, are passed down from cell to cell. Okay, and also from generation to generation. But how do we fit this long molecule of DNA into our nucleus? Well, we have to condense it, pack it down um, into something that's called a chromosome. A chromosome. 
so more terminology, okay? I like to say that biology is a new language to learn because there's so many new words, there's so many new terminology that you just have to know the definition of to actually understand the concept. Um, first of all, there's something that's called a double helix. Like I said before, the DNA is made up of two strands. Well, these two strands that are connected together, what they do is that they kind of coil together and they form this double helix, like a helix. And then your DNA molecules are made up of subunits called a nucleotide. A nucleotide. And a nucleotide is made up of a phosphate group, a sugar, and a nitrogenous base. And then in your DNA, you have four different types of nucleotides. And then the only difference between these four types are, is the nitrogenous base, okay? So here, adenine, one of the nucleotides, it will base pair with thymine. And thymine can only be found in DNA, okay? So the similarity between these two types of nucleotides is the phosphate and the sugar. The only difference is that adenine has an adenine nitrogenous base and thymine has a thymine nitrogenous base. So that's two of the nucleotides. The other two is guanine that base pairs with cytosine. Okay, so guanine will always find cytosine to base pair with. Adenine will always base pair with thymine. And then you have something that's called a genetic code. It's just the way that um, the DNA is read um, to make a protein. So what happens is that DNA, it contains instructions to make anything, um, particularly proteins. So we go from DNA to RNA, and then RNA is a similar language that uses guanine, cytosine, and adenine. But instead of using thymine, it uses a nucleotide called uracil, uracil, and that's abbreviated with a U, okay? In science, we like to categorize things even more. Um, you have organisms that are single-celled, so they're called unicellular organisms, and then you have us, which are made up of trillions and trillions of cells, so we are multicellular organisms. Some examples of um, single-celled organisms are prokaryotes, which are the bacteria and archaeans. An example, you know, here's a picture of bacteria. And then you have eukaryotes that have a nucleus. Well, yeast is a type of fungi that is unicellular. It's only made up of one cell. And then you have amoebas and paramecians, um, which are proteins or protozoans. And then you can find these organisms in freshwater ponds. And then let's compare that with our multicellular organisms. So these multicellular organisms will mostly include eukaryotes, and then they include fungi, um, particularly mold and mushrooms, okay? And then one way I like to memorize that mold and mushrooms are multicellular, if you notice that they all start with an M. So when you see mold, you think of multicellular. When you see mushrooms, you think of multicellular. And of course, plants are multicellular, and us animals are multicellular. There are three um, domains of life. We have archaea, bacteria, okay? So these are pretty inclusive. And then here we have another domain called Eukara. And then Eukara will include lower divisions called kingdoms. That will include fungi, animalia, plantae, and protista. So here, this picture right here, it just shows you how things are categorized. So your domain will be your most inclusive, that will include the most species. And then as you move down, it becomes more exclusive. It becomes more particular, okay? And then um, a, uh, 
mnemonic that I found on the internet to help you memorize this in order is delicate, kind professors can often fail good students. Try not to get the domains and kingdoms uh, mixed up. Okay. So the four kingdoms, there's a chart on page six in your lecture notes that is really good at kind of summarizing everything. So fill in that chart to the best of your ability. So under domain Eukara, we have four kingdoms. We have the kingdom of fungi that are mostly decomposers. And what do they do? They break down um, dead material or complex organic material into simple nutrients. And these will include your mushrooms, mold, Okay, and then the only exception is your yeast, which will consume glucose. Okay, so they are consumers. And then remember, your yeast are unicellular organisms. And then the next kingdom is animalia, which is us, um, any type of animals. Um, includes your vultures. Okay, so remember, vultures are consumers. They're not decomposers. Um, you also have plantae, which they play the role of producers. And then the last kingdom is protista, which are mostly unicellular. So algae, which can, um, some algae can undergo photosynthesis so that they um, become producers. And then algae, some algae are unicellular organisms and then some are multicellular organisms. And then you have your protozoans, which are consumers. And then these protozoans will include those freshwater pond um, organisms like amoeba and paramecians. So I have a review question for you guys. An organism is unicellular, has a cell wall, but no nucleus. What domain would this organism be placed in? Try to answer this yourself. I'll give you a moment. Relatively simple, so it would be bacteria or archaea. Okay, so remember they are single-celled and they have a cell wall, but since they are prokaryotes, they do not have a nucleus. What do they have instead? They have that nucleoid region. Here's another question. What are the basic requirements to be a, uh, to be a cell? Choose all that applies. I'll give you guys a moment. So if you answer A, cell membrane or plasma membrane, which is the same thing, um, and then sometimes you'll hear it as cellular membrane as well, um, it's all the same. Uh, all cells need that. We need genetic material, which is the DNA. Do we need a nucleus? No, uh, the prokaryotic cells don't have a nucleus and they're living, they're a cell. Um, we all need a cytoplasm. We all don't need a cell wall. Animal cells don't have a cell wall. But we all need ribosomes to make proteins so that we can keep on living. One last question. An organism is multicellular, has a cell wall, but is non-photosynthetic. Uh, what kingdom would this organism be placed in? Fungi, and then that would include your um, mushrooms, mold, okay? So they have cell wall that are made of chitin, but they don't undergo photosynthesis, so they can't produce their own food. Remember, they are decomposers. Mold and mushrooms are decomposers. So those are just some examples of the multiple choice questions that could be on your um, exam, your homework questions. Okay, evolution. So evolution happens um, during a long span of time. You know, we can't expect evolution to occur in, you know, a couple of years. It occurs over, you know, thousands and thousands of years. What happens is that species, they will acquire um, certain traits that may be advantageous to um, survive in their environment. And if they can survive in their environment, that means that they can reproduce and make offspring so that their genes can keep on um, going, so that their species can survive. Okay, so that's the that's the definition of evolution, a simple way to say evolution. Okay.
And then if we look on this picture here, you know, if we see in the past, you know, this is us, uh, cavemen. Um, we've come a long way. And then in the future, you never know, you know, we could acquire some traits that will give us superpowers. Um, you know, these days they can have cats that will glow green. We can make bacteria glow green. Um, you never know. The uh, possibilities are endless. And evolution is basically is a theory. So we can't exactly prove it correct even though we know we you know we see it and then we know that it's true it's based on a theory that Charles Darwin made up okay and then he based evolution on natural selection and the natural selection is basically what drives evolution it's just saying that um, you know the strongest um, will survive the fittest will uh, survive and it doesn't always have to you know be with strength or, you know, being strong. It could just be, you know, having the correct traits, whether that, you know, um, having the correct color or having the correct, you know, knowledge or having the correct structure to survive in that environment so you can reproduce and so you can make offspring and pass down those genes. So it's survival of the fittest, basically. And then he based the natural selection theory on four observations. And then these four observations can be depicted best by the scenario in your book. So the scenario, what happened is in the when the Industrial Revolution came about in the 18th, 19th century, when things were getting built, when industries were coming about, the railroad, automobiles, um, what happens, you know, when these are being built, um, these factories, they would release soot, okay, black smoke, and then the black smoke would get onto the soil and it would make the soil black. So if you have a population of different colored beetles, you have your dark colored beetles, you have your medium colored beetles, and then your light colored beetles. And then if you have a predator, such as a bird, which colored beetles would that predator um, most likely eat, would be able to see first, is the light colored beetle. So that means your dark colored beetles and your medium colored beetles would survive and be able to reproduce and pass down those genes that is advantageous for this environment. But if you think about it, what happens if the soot cleared away from the soil and then the soil became light colored again? So that means your habitat or your environment change, and then eventually your population of the beetle species would change as well. You would have more frequency of the white colored beetle or light colored beetles. Okay, so natural selection it depends on the environment um, also if it changes or if it stays the same. Lastly, let's talk about the scientific method. In all experiments done by students, instructors, um, scientists, we will all go through the series of steps to ensure that a good experiment is carried out. Okay, So you will have to know these six steps in the order. So the first is you make an observation, you know, you see a, some type of phenomenon, um, and then you ask a question, and then you make a hypothesis. So, for example, I just got a physical and then my calcium levels were low. Okay, so that's my observation. And then my question is, what can I do to increase my calcium levels? My hypothesis, sometimes the hypothesis can be in an if and then statement, but it doesn't always have to be. You can say that taking calcium supplement can increase my calcium levels. Or you can say, if I take calcium uh, supplements, then my calcium levels will go up. And then next step is that I will conduct an experiment. And then the experiment would be taking uh, calcium pills. And then your experiment comprises of three variables. The first one is your control. And then the control is the group that does not change. And then for my experiment, the control is me not taking the calcium pill. Okay, so before my physical. 
And then your next variable is the independent variable, which is the group that you are treating or the group that you are manipulating, changing. So the independent variable in my experiment would be me taking the calcium pills or the calcium supplements. And then the last variable for the experiment portion is called the dependent variable. And then the dependent var variable is basically the results of the outcome. And there's no other way to really say it, but the dependent variable depends on the independent variable. And it's usually something that can be measured. So in my experiment, what can I measure? I can measure my calcium levels. That would be my dependent variable. My calcium level changed because of me taking the calcium supplements. And then your fifth step are the results. You publish the results. Um, you know, what are my calcium levels? And then lastly, you make a conclusion. Did I prove my hypothesis? Um, I don't know yet, but I'm sure I did. I'm sure my calcium levels have gone up. So, you know, you want to know if uh, taking calcium supplements did indeed increase the calcium levels. Another example of these variables um, is with plants. So in this experiment, I'm testing to see if, if I give plants different types of liquids, will that increase their height? Will that have an effect on their growth? So my hypothesis, you know, you don't always have to prove the hypothesis. Sometimes the hypothesis is um, proven wrong in an experiment, but that's okay. Scientists will still publish it just so that they can share their data with the scientific community. And then, you know, other scientists can make changes to um, uh, prove that hypothesis correct, or they can even change the original hypothesis. Okay. So in this experiment, let's identify what the control is. So the, the control is the variable that does not change, the group that does not change. So that means that we giving us, no, sorry, um, us giving the plant water, that's the normal situation. You know, we normally don't give them any other type of liquid. Um, water is your control, okay? And then in any experiment, you want to have as many controls as possible. For example, you know, the same type of plant, you want to use the same type of plant throughout. You want to use the you know, same amount of soil, the same amount of pot size, the same amount of liquid, the same amount of exposure to sunlight, the placement of these pots, of these plants. Um, the more controls you have, the better. The control, it can be used as the baseline to compare it to. It can be used like as a reference point. And then your next variable is the independent uh, independent variable. So what are you changing? Well, we're changing the type of liquid. Okay, so in this case, we can use Coke or we can use orange juice. So that is your independent variable. And then lastly, your dependent variable, which depends on your independent variable, um, what can be measured? Okay, so now that we've given our plant these three types of liquids, what can we measure to know if, um, if we've proven our hypothesis? Well, we can measure the height of the plant, the amount of leaves, foliage, the girth of the stalk. Okay, so that would be your dependent variable. But I can't imagine, you know, giving juice or uh, Coke uh, will make the plant grow as well as the water because those, well, we just learned about photosynthesis. Plants need photosynthesis to grow. Um, so.